In this episode of Shaping the Future, I'm speaking to climate scientist Professor James Renwick about the scale of the risks posed by the melting of the East and West Antarctic ice sheets due to human emissions from our relentless burning of fossil fuels. Sea level rise is the most obvious impact that will destroy cities around the world, but there are also other less obvious impacts on agriculture and population displacement that can also lead to conflict if we choose to continue to do nothing. James is based at Victoria University in New Zealand, specialising in large-scale climate variations and was awarded the Prime Minister's Science Prize by Jacinda Ardern in 2018. Thanks for listening to Shaping the Future. In the next episode, I will be speaking to philosopher Rupert Reid about the University of East Anglia's forthcoming Philosophy Public Lecture Series 2021. Bad news is good news? Question mark. The upside of doubt. James, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to me this morning or your evening. You previously described the mountain Antarctica as a ticking time bomb. Can you tell us about your recent study and what you set out to investigate that led you to this statement? Well, it's really about our commitment to sea level rise and how sensitive parts of the Antarctic ice sheets are to warming, especially in the ocean, but also to how the melting of ice plays out across the globe. But, you know, if you melt a certain amount of ice from Antarctica or Greenland or the glaciers, you know, it's not the case that you see an even rise in sea levels across the whole globe. In fact, the sea level rise tends to be larger further away from the ice sheet, which is an interesting phenomenon to do with the, basically the weight of ice and water on the surface of the planet and the gravitational field of the ice sheet and so on. So that the net result is that when you melt ice, especially say in the West Antarctic, what you see is a maximum in the rise of sea levels along the east coast of North America and and across other parts of the North Atlantic, actually. And for a place like New Zealand, where I am, the rise in sea level is relatively, well, not minor, but, but it's less than you see in the Northern Hemisphere. And vice versa, when you see melting of ice off Greenland, you see more rise in sea levels in the Southern Hemisphere and less rise in the Northern Hemisphere. You mentioned Greenland, and we know that's melting fairly fast at the moment. And mm, in terms indeed. of Antarctica, we're really talking about the scale of the problem. Can you just shed some light on what we're talking about in terms of scale when it comes to Antarctica? Certainly, yes. And it's quite hard to grasp just how much ice there is frozen on the Antarctic continent. I think especially in the northern hemisphere a lot of a lot of people are probably familiar roughly with how much ice there is on greenland and that's roughly equivalent to how much ice there is in the west antarctic i mean it's not it's a little bit more actually so if you melted all of the greenland ice sheet you would get something like five meters of global sea level rise if you melted all of the west antarctic ice sheet you would get on the order it's more like four meters it's a bit less it's still pretty significant but if you melted all the ice on the East Antarctic ice sheet, that's the main part of Antarctica, you get somewhere between 50 and 60 metres of sea level rise. So it's an order of magnitude, 10 times, more than 10 times greater than either Greenland or the West Antarctic ice themselves. So if you melt all the ice, then you've got something like somewhere between 70 and 80 metres of sea level rise. That would take a very long time. It's a huge amount of ice and it would take thousands of years to actually all melt. But parts of it might be irreversibly committed to melting within the next few decades, actually. So we may be committing ourselves to some metres of sea level rise within 20, 30, 40 years. And ultimately, if warming continues at the rate it has lately, yeah, we're talking about 10 times that much sea level rise, but it would take a very long time to happen. Okay. In, in the information that I was sent about your paper, there was a reference to the idea of a tipping point being crossed mm. that could lead to 20 metres of sea level rise. I mean, this is an unimaginable global tragedy, so it's five metres, really. But it's kind of, can you talk a little bit about 
how that figure came about. Sure. And it's like a lot of climate research, it's piecing together a puzzle, both from the historical record, the geological record, but also from uh, looking at the physics of how the ice sheets work and modelling the future and modelling how these ice sheets respond to warming and so on. So synthesising all of that, what, what we know from the geological record is that at times in the past when temperatures have been around what they are now or a little bit higher, a degree or two higher than the present, and crucially carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have been similar to what they are now or maybe a little bit higher. Global sea levels have been somewhere between 5 and 20 metres higher than present. And the reason for the discrepancy, partly I think, is that the records we have from looking at sediment cores, you know, the kind of ocean drilling kind of experiments that are done, you can't pull out year-to-year -year variability. You know, it's all century-long averages. It's, it's quite crude in terms of the temporal resolution, the timescale resolution. We're talking from one century to, or even one millennium to the next. So what happens on a human lifetime is a little, little hard <laughs> to determine, impossible actually. What we know is that if carbon dioxide levels stay as high as they are now or a little higher for that kind of length of time, a century or two or three, then yes, you do lock in the melting of large amounts of ice. So we know from the past that this has happened. We've seen, you know, 10, 20 metres higher than present. And we're starting to understand that basically where that comes from, and this is actually to do with better mapping of the continent of Antarctica itself, so the land that is underneath all of the ice on the Antarctic continent. We've known the shape of Antarctica for a long time, but it's the concept that the ice is so heavy, it's pushed the land surface down down below sea level in a lot of places. This is most obvious in the West Antarctic, near the Antarctic Peninsula, for instance, and that's well known to be the interior of the West Antarctic is over a thousand metres below sea level. So once you get warm water over the coast, as it were, it'll run downhill to lie underneath the ice, start to lubricate the ice, start to float the ice and it'll slide off the continent quite quickly. What's become apparent quite recently, actually, is there are parts of the East Antarctic that are in a similar situation. Not, not, as, not quite as prone to this process as the West Antarctic, but still, there's a lot more ice in the East Antarctic, so the stakes are a bit higher. And there are some of the big outlet glaciers, some of the sort of sectors of the East Antarctic, have the same kind of configuration where the land surface has been pushed down well below sea level and there are like little wedges of ice. Well, when I say little wedges, we're talking about areas of ice as big as France or Germany. You know, these are quite big Tiny. pieces of ice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll stop using words like little. Um, very large <laughs> volumes of ice that, again, if we have this warmer water coming in over the what's called the grounding line, basically the coastline of Antarctica, and getting underneath the ice, it will start to float even huge depths, you know, three or four kilometres depth of ice, and lubricate the movement and it will flow off the continent quickly. And once that process starts, that can't be stopped. So we know we can get four metres or so from the West Antarctic. And some of the recent model runs with ice sheet models and climate models simulating warming of the oceans and the atmosphere have managed to reproduce four periods in the past, a few million years ago, where we had similar levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and so on. They've been able to simulate the kinds of rise in sea level that we see from other aspects of the geological record or just, you know, eroded beaches and, and that kind of thing, just actual rock faces that would have had to have had sea levels at a certain height to see the kind of erosion and weathering that we see. So we're able now to marry up the geological record of the sea level itself and the physical processes that go on on the ice sheets as we know them now that, that would produce those kinds of changes in sea level. And we know actually from the quite well documented information coming out of the last ice age over the last 20,000 years that there were periods in that time and between 20 and 10,000 years ago where sea levels globally rose by up to four metres in 100 years, four metres per century, because there was some kind of big injection of, of meltwater into either the North Atlantic or the, the Southern Oceans. So we know that that kind of thing can happen. We can get these very rapid either melting events or just floating events. If you can take a big chunk of ice off the continent and get it out into the ocean, that will 
raise sea levels, not quite instantaneously, but it will be quite a rapid process. So we know this can happen. We've seen it in the past record. And we just we don't know exactly when it might happen in the future, but we do know that it, we could be getting close to that kind of threshold. There's a couple of things with the timeline. One thing I've heard other scientists say is that they've tended to lowball the rate of mm. climate change. And now we're realizing that the Earth system can respond faster. There can be a greater sensitivity. That's a warning. It's not a guarantee that, we're get, that everything's happening much faster. And That's I just, right. These are the sort of variables, this timeline, but also the scale. What you yeah. talked about is the east and the west side, an incredible scale. That kind of does lead us on to global impacts. So can you talk a little bit about some of the impacts that we could expect around the world? Well, the impacts of rapid sea level rise are are kind of obvious, I guess. We have built a lot of cities, a lot of infrastructure near the coast for obvious reasons. You know, it's, it's been convenient in the past to have population cities built near the coast for trade purposes and transport and so on, ocean going vessels. And that's been fine while the sea levels haven't been rising. Now that they are rising again, an awful lot of people, you know, of large populations of coastal cities and so on are, are at risk. So we may well see the displacement of millions hundreds of millions of people possibly as a result of sea level rise, people just seeing their homeland disappearing under their feet and having to find somewhere else to live. So that's a a real danger. Again, you know, we're talking even with relatively rapid sea level rise, we're talking 100 years or so. So it's something that we can hopefully respond to in good time. Some Some of the more rapid changes though, if we're talking about two or three degrees more warming, the changes in extreme weather events, heavy rainfalls, high temperature extremes and so on, droughts on food security, on crop production, food production. I think those things are greater risks in the shorter term, actually. We could see major problems with volatility in international global food security, commodity prices and, yeah, food shortages. And that kind of thing could lead, again, to well, widespread hunger, but also displacement of people if large populations are no longer able to feed themselves and they're going to want to move to somewhere where they can and have a more sustainable life, then that's going to create problems. So I think those kinds of things are the biggest dangers that human societies face over the next 50 years or so. Yeah, and we've proved struggle with coping with immigration, even on relatively small scales compared to what we're talking about here. Well, that's right. I mean, the terrible situation across the Mediterranean with people coming from northern Africa across to southern Europe or the Middle East. Yeah, I mean, that's an awful situation, a very difficult situation. And it's, in a way, a kind of microcosm of what could be happening on a much larger scale as we see more widespread extreme events. And we're already seeing big fires in the places that are prone to such things, you know, Western US and Eastern Australia and so on. And the Syrian civil war is well known to be at least partly triggered by the big drought that happened there that has a pretty strong climate change signature. So it's it's that idea that if you're in a volatile situation, like a lot of countries in North Africa and the Middle East are, if you add on climate change related droughts or food shortages, whatever, that's just going to make the situation that much worse. And it could push populations into some kind of conflict or warfare. And that kind of scenario could spread much more widely. That brings us back to to where we are now, because we talk a lot about the impact of, let's say, Antarctic melting on human society, but really... This is about the human impact on Antarctic ice melting. And <laughs> exactly. Can you talk about how this links back to how we as a society view our actions now? I mean, climate change is going mainstream. The American new administration is strong on it. The UK is trying to be. Europe is forging ahead and China's making an announcement. You know, it's kind of... Mm, mm. We're seeing some, some positive signals there, but how critical do you see it when you look at all of this? Well, I agree. We are seeing some positive signals. And the international policy conversation now is very different to what it was even 10 years ago. The Paris Agreement was a great step forward from an international relations point of view. We haven't seen the action that follows yet, but we're, we're getting closer, I think. And a lot of countries, significant, big emitters like China, like Japan, are announcing zero carbon targets, 2050, 2060, you know, in the next 30 or 40 years, that would be consistent if these countries were able to actually live up to those pledges. 
and other countries followed suit. You know, New Zealand has a zero carbon act and the UK is, is aiming for, the, and a lot of the EU actually is aiming for the same kind of thing, getting to zero net carbon dioxide emissions in the next 30 or so years. If enough countries did that and lived up to it, then we would stop global warming, stop climate change at a level that hopefully would be manageable. You know, we're talking one and a half degrees of warming, maybe a little bit more than that. But it is really a race against time now the, the, the science has been pretty clear for 30 or 40 years, actually. The idea that we would have something like three degrees of warming with a doubling of carbon dioxide at levels compared to the pre-industrial era has been mainstream in climate science since the late 1970s. If we had started tackling the problem when we started really talking about it internationally, when the United Nations set up the Framework Convention on Climate Change at the Rio Summit in 1992, when the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, was founded in the late 1980s, if the countries of the world had actually started to reduce emissions then, we wouldn't be having this conversation now, I don't yeah. think. that We'd be in a much better place, that's for sure. In fact, things have gone in the opposite direction in that last 30 years. And the size of the problem is roughly double what it was in the late 80s. We've got the, the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is approximately twice what it was in the late 1980s now. So we've gone absolutely in the wrong direction. And we are now in a pretty, well, yeah, really urgent situation. It's still physically possible if, if, the, if the global economy can be moved to renewable energy quickly enough and at a level that really cuts into greenhouse gas emissions, then, yeah. then it's all still possible and we can you know, save the, the West Antarctic ice sheet and all the rest of it. But we really, we really need to get on with it yeah. and, and make some significant progress in the next few years. Okay, we are literally all in this together. So We certainly are. James, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me on your Friday evening. Okay, well, very nice to talk to you.